Um, okay, let's let's do it again. Hi, hello, everyone. Welcome to our second Talking Heads of the 2021 Academic here at Head Genève. This semester of lectures discusses the new possible models of creation and the consequences on system of production and promotion of art and design. I'm Alexa Mathieu. I'm not sure you can see me, but now you can hear me. I'm the course leader of Master Media Design. I am live, I mean almost live, from our new campus of Head Genève in the Cube, and I'm really excited for tonight's discussion that will focus on the subject of new economies of creation with two valuable guests that I would like to warmly welcome and thanks for their virtual presence with us tonight, Lorraine Purter and Silvio Lorusso. I will say a brief introduction about our guests and also introduce a, a, a brief uh, change of planning uh, tonight, uh, but we're just going to go with it. So, Lorraine Furter is a graphic designer and researcher based in Brussels since 2007. 2007. She is specialized in editorial design, hybrid publishing, and intersectional feminism. Since 2017, she is working on a research project entitled Speaking Volumes, Art, Activism, and Feminist Publishing, for which she recently got a PhD position in Aria since Lucas Antwerp in September 2019. Um, so, due to a crazy series of technical issues uh, that we are experiencing tonight, um, we are really sorry to say that Lorraine Purter could not join us. Um, I know she's watching. Hello, Lorraine. I know she's uh, on the chat and she will also, you know, share some, um, some questions maybe and some, some remarks that she has. Um, her presentation um, was actually supposed uh, to be about uh, really based on her experience actually in the design and cultural field and she really wanted to sh to share with us um, how she's so much inspired by practices that she learned from cultural workers and activists in the past years. She was also supposed to focus her talk on um, how can we build fairer uh, working condition in a society that is rooted in capitalist, patriarchal and colonial practices so, you know, if you have questions for Lorraine, please share them in the chat. Uh, she will make sure, you know, she will, she will, uh, I'm sure she will answer them. And we will try to find a way to get Lorraine to share her point of view later in the week. Um, the format is, uh, is up to our discussion, but we will make sure that Lorraine can, uh, can um, share, share her point of view. I'd like also to, to introduce you to our second guest tonight, who is here. <laughs> Hello, Silvio. Silvio Lorusso. Um, so, Silvio, you are a writer, artist, educator, and designer living in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Your work engaged with the tension surrounding notions of labor, productivity, autonomy, self-design, entrepreneurialism, precarity, and failure. In 2018, you published your first book entitled Entrepreneuria, Everyone is an Entrepreneur, Nobody is Safe. You have a PhD in Design Sciences from the UAV University of Venice. Welcome, Silvio. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks so much for the introduction. Okay, perfect. Um, before we jump in into our guest presentation, uh, I will give a brief framework of how the talk is going to go tonight. So we have to improvise a new format, but uh, let's go. So firstly, Silvio will introduce his book, Entrepreneuria. And then he will specifically unpack the clashes between entrepreneurialism and precarity that are taking place on online marketplaces such as Fiverr.com. And then we'll have a discussion with Silvio, the two of us. I have a set of questions that is ready to go that I prepared with um, actually Master Media Design students first years. So I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to you, uh, all the students from Master Media Design, for your work and engagement. I really enjoyed preparing this session with you. I hope you're here watching behind the screen. Um, yeah, and also I, 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 you know, make sure that you ask questions. Um, we will we will do our best to share them, and then we'll see how we can also share Lorraine's perspective later in the week. Okay, Silvio, are you ready to share your presentation with us? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Let me do that. Okay. Oh, and also I, I will make sure that um, I share all the references that I shared by Silvio and Lauren in, in, uh, in our Instagram account later and also on Head's website. Do 
you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. <coughs> okay, and you can also see me, right? Just to, to be sure. Uh, yes, I think your image is going to come up at some point, but we can see your presentation and we can hear you, so that's perfect. <laughs> okay, so uh, shall I start then? Yes, yes. Okay, well, well. First of all, let me let me thank you, Alexia, and all uh, at Genève for uh, for the great logistical effort, and of course for the invitation of having me here. Of course, I'm very sorry not uh, that uh, I won't be able to be joined by Lorraine, which I've been known for for years. So it would have been nice to uh, have a synchronous uh, conversation, but we will have a, a synchronous one. Um, and I'm very grateful of this opportunity to present uh, the book that I published um, last year. And my plan for today is to go a bit uh, uh, into, let's say, the theoretical premise uh, that is around the book and then go straight and focus on, uh, uh, as Alexia anticipated, into the, uh, the way in which a certain ideology is um, uh, incorporated within uh, online marketplaces for uh, for freelance work. And then I'm going to uh, briefly unpack uh, something that I'm, I've been working more recently, uh, which has to do with the politics of delegation, like who does what in the in in, uh, in context of, of uh, art and design. But uh, yeah, let's start from, from the book. I mean, you see it uh, in the slides, I have it here. Um, it was published uh, originally two years ago in Italian, uh, with a very different design with uh, you can see like this spread of uh, uh, all male entrepreneurs that hold uh, let's say the the, the, the power positions um, in the uh, let's say in the pantheon of uh, uh, of CEO and founders uh, and I generally like to introduce the book by uh, telling an origin story as uh, founders would also do and startups also do and the origin story has to do with uh, with an article that uh, an interview that was written uh, about me uh, when I was 29 years old. Uh, and of course, for me, this was a, a good chance, uh, you know, like also to position myself as a designer, as a uh, as a practitioner. This the, this interview came out uh, in one of the let's say the, the most important Italian newspapers in the cultural section. So big deal for me, at least at the time. Uh, so I gave this interview in which I was trying to shed a semi-positive light, I would say, on, uh, on what I do and uh, sort of communicate my enthusiasm for uh, for my work. Uh, but then, like, I got a certain surprise when I got the, the actual interview. So what you read in the title is like uh, 10 years studying design, 100 requests, uh, job, job application sent. Um, so that, at that point, I didn't know exactly what to do because I felt like um, a bit manipulated by this uh, this interview, like um, sort of being used as a sort of generational cliche. You can imagine the Italian context in which like unemployment is very high. So I, I felt like I was used to to give a certain um, uh, to, to strengthen a certain narrative. And you can even see that there was like this little sad face uh, uh, attached to my uh, profile. So I've been keeping like thinking about this um, and uh, let's say all the reflection on this, this uh, let's say two different narratives clashing within a person. What is in a way what um, uh, led me later on to look at entrepreneurialism and precarity and how these two things are um, somehow um, happening within the same, the, the same, let's say, narrative space. And I think a nice, um, a good, good, good representation of this tension uh, was was um, was expressed by um, German philosopher Bjorn Schulhan, who said uh, in in a book called Psychopolitics that uh, yeah, as you read today, we we don't feel like subjugated subjects, but uh, we are asked to become or to consider ourselves projects. So always refashioning and reinventing ourselves. Um, so now bringing it back to the interview, you see how much the, the project narrative um, was, uh, let's say, um, sort of put to the side to the subject, to the subjugated subject narrative. 
Uh, and in these two words, like project and subject, I think there is much of uh, what you would uh, call uh, entrepreneurialism and precarity. Um, and you, you must, uh, you, you might, um, you might articulate this this uh, tension also within an historical perspective, in which um, a call for this refashioning and uh, uh, reinvention has been like uh, sort of planned in a certain theory. So, for example, Peter Drucker in the 80s was um, pushing for uh, a society, he would call it an entrepreneurial society, one um, full of uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. And his big, uh, let's say, theoretical uh, move uh, was to say, OK, entrepreneurs are not just an elite within society, but every citizen should become to, to, uh, to a certain extent an innovator and an entrepreneur. Um, and during the years, uh, let's say this this mindset, this um, this way of seeing oneself has been popularized. Mm -hmm. So you see also in pop culture certain um, a strong expression of this uh, of this mentality. So for example, this is a phrenology of an entrepreneur. Phrenology, you know, is like this uh, pseudoscience meant to um, identify, understand character of one person by the shape of their skull. Of course, it's uh, it's a joke. Uh, it's like uh, an ironic uh, take on 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 uh, like feature, character feature. Of course, this is not true. Uh, but it's interesting to see what someone um, who would uh, define an entrepreneurial mindset, what kind of features would uh, uh, they uh, would, would they uh, uh, highlight? So you see that um, uh, a big chunk of the character has to do with this idea of being able to create uh, one's own reality. And for me, this is a very important point because um, a lot of the entrepreneurial discourse has has to uh, has to do with, uh, uh, let's say, with an idea of interpreting basically a certain reality. So you can uh, see uh, a certain situation as a opportunity for change or, or uh, as a uh, let's say an, an incumbent failure or something like that. Um, and we see that this ideology uh, has been uh, very uh, strongly cl clarified also in uh, uh, by, by people who have uh, uh, a, a, a strong position of power, such as Ryd Hoffman, who is uh, among uh, the, the founders of LinkedIn, who um, again like generalizes this idea of entrepreneurship, uh, extending to all the, the human uh, the human race basically. And uh, in the books that he writes, uh, you might find the way in which like this narrative, this entrepreneurial narrative somehow uh, has um, a sort of other side, which is very gloomy uh, and grim. Um, that has to do with the fact that, OK, when you become an entrepreneur, if you consider yourself uh, an entrepreneur, much of the risk uh, that has to do with your practice is upon yourself. Um, the government, and, and here I'm quoting Ryd Hoffman, literally, the government won't be there to, uh, to, to come and pick you when you fall. Mm -hmm. So this is where the, the title, let's say the, the main slogan on the cover of the book comes from. Um, it's not like my statement, it's a sort of like um, strong and synthetic formulation of the uh, consequences of a certain entrepreneurial mindset. And you can see a bit the style of this. Uh, the design of the book of the English version is by uh, an Italian designer group called Superness. Uh, and they played a bit with this idea of, um, uh, how to put it, uh, let's say um, a pulp, uh, pulp office style. Uh, so post-it uh, um, highlighters and so on and so forth. So in these slides, I try to summarize a bit uh, uh, the take of, uh, let's say, the, the main the main thesis of the book. So um, basically, uh, my my critique is not towards entrepreneurship as a practice, which uh, even writing a book is an entrepreneurial endeavor and publishing it, but more to the the narrative, the ideology, and the system of value. Uh, around entrepreneurship, and that is what I call entrepreneurialism. So there is a sort of vi uh, vicious loop between entrepreneurialism and precarity, because of course, by uh, encouraging risk, uh, entrepreneurialism um, also encourages um, a precarious uh, state. But at the same time, 
it delegitimizes um, the, the concerns that uh, a precarious mindset might have to say, okay, uh, risk is not uh, good, it's not like good for my health, for my financial situation. So it's a sort of eulogy of risk. And uh, what, is more, um, what is more ironic in a way is that uh, precarity uh, is then forced somehow to seek a way out through its own condition by means of entrepreneurialism. So if I don't find a job, I'm gonna invent a job. So the notion common to both, uh, let's say, to, do, uh, to both uh, prism to look at reality is change. You might say that um, a precarious, uh, let's say, uh, interpretation of change has to do more with fear and concern and, uh, um, yeah, uh, worry. Uh, while and the entrepreneurialist idea of change has always have to do with, uh, uh, with a certain degree of enthusiasm, of opportunism. Uh, and now, uh, this is something that I don't do very, um, let's say, um, straightforward in the book. So I, have, I, I like this chance to really uh, summarize, let's say, uh, the signals of uh, what entrepreneurship and entrepreneurialism is. So this is a very basic, uh, um, how would you call it, a dictionary definition of entrepreneurship. There is nothing bad or questionable in this. It's something that happens in reality. People uh, take financial risk in the hope for profit. Again, uh, writing a book is a financial risk because you invest a lot of your time uh, and uh, you hope for a um, profit that might be economical or merely uh, in terms of um, prestige or recognition. But then um, we see how entrepreneurialism has like, uh, can charge this idea of entrepreneurship with uh, uh, with a degree of, um, uh, with, with the value understanding and with the, with a certain uh, value bias. So, for example, by saying that in society, the entrepreneurs are the ones that produce progress and not all the masses of workers or even scientists, for instance. Another signal of uh, uh, entrepreneurialist mentality has to do with uh, calling gig workers uh, and entrepreneurs, which is strategic also at the level of legislation. Uh, and I think like um, uh, Joan Cornella played with this uh, with this tension in uh, uh, is a Spanish uh, illustrator. He played a bit with uh, with this tension in a very uh, grim and sarcastic take on what an entrepreneur is uh, by looking at um, um, let's say, uh, yeah, at the gig economy, you know, with this uh, very iconic uh, um, cube. Another way to, uh, to, 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 to see this, to, to see this red flag of entrepreneurialism is to um, deem like irrelevant who, who just simply gets a job, uh, like a waged worker. Um, and uh, another very strong and fundamental way of, uh, uh, of entrepreneurialist mentality has to do with, uh, with a specific notion of freedom. Uh, uh, freedom to be your own boss, to control yourself. And I think there is a very nice allegory of this idea uh, in this uh, found image, which became a meme. So it's basically not the freedom um, to do something, but sort of, uh, sort of uh, disassociative uh, dis freedom in which, uh, you know, you split and become the boss and at the same time the exploited one to a certain extent. Another uh, instance of uh, ironically reflecting on this, uh, this strange idea of freedom and autonomy comes from this uh, Instagram uh, uh, humorous account. So in which you can see a uh, uh, a woman that starts freelancing and becomes uh, basically not more empowered, but simply like the, 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 the people telling her what to do are like more, more. So it's just like distributing the power that she has uh, on, on her uh, activity. Uh, and there is a word that uh, I started using uh, for this, and this is um, uh, borrowed from um, a writer and director called Astra Taylor. She coined the word uh, photomation to speak of like automation that is not truly automatic. But you can apply a similar concept, a similar fun to this idea of freedom that is not really freedom. So autonomy that is not really autonomous. 
and therefore you could call it autonomy somehow. And finally, uh, I added this today uh, because I was looking in the news and of course I'm curious of how this uh, uh, the, 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 the Corona situation is impacting this mentality. And uh, you can see that this is having a lot of effects with lifelong learning. So um, the Chancellor uh, Rishi Sunak suggested musicians and others in art, uh, also uh, art designers I suppose, to retrain uh, in the light of, um, uh, of the Corona crisis. So you can see the dark side of lifelong learning, which on paper sounds really nice because who wouldn't want to spend their life uh, learning new skills? But here is a learning uh, uh, and a renovation of oneself that is based on the demands of the market. And again, not the autonomy of a, uh, of a person, of an individual, of a citizen. So uh, going into the way in which those ideas are crystallized into a platform, I looked into Fiverr. Um, which at the very beginning looked like this when it was launched first. It, it looked a bit like a social experiment, you know, um, um, a sort of uh, candid camera side. So what would you do? What are uh, you willing to do for five dollars? So if we fast forward to like 10 years, you see how uh, the, the, the site professionalized itself, became like very professional. So what do you find when you go on Fiverr? So you find, uh, you find people who will design logos for you in six hours, uh, people playing games with you, um, people like uh, augmenting the numbers of, uh, of your followers, uh, even like counseling for your relationships and uh, uh, sort of weird stuff like uh, Jesus uh, Christ uh, um, sp sp spelling out a message for you. Uh, so you see that there is a sort of uh, micro entertaining uh, fi uh, entertainment feel in this uh, in this platform. So how does it work? Very, very basic. Three steps. A seller publishes a gig, for example, a designer. Uh, I'm going to do a logo for you in uh, uh, in black and white. I don't know. And then someone buys this gig, commissions it and Fiverr takes 20 percent of the transaction. Uh, the thing, uh, the, 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 the whole platform it went viral when it was launched because of course everybody was curious to see how, uh, like what people would do uh, for five dollars, what they would come up with. So why five dollars? This was more or less like the smartest, uh, uh, the smart idea of Fiverr, which is to break all the negotiation part that takes place between a freelancer and a commissioner. Uh, and just productivize the service. So turn the, the, the service into a product. So it's something that you can buy with a click without having to uh, ask for quotes. Uh, and um, as an advantage for freelancers, you could say uh, uh, this is the narrative that um, uh, Fiverr um, proposes to slice your talent. So to slice your talent into five dollars bit. So this doesn't mean that uh, by making a logo, you gain necessarily five dollars, uh, but you can make packages of five dollars. Now this this original um, feature has disappeared, so everybody can put as much as they want. And of course, there is another advantage, at least on paper. So you are immediately paid. Uh, and all of this is what makes uh, somehow Fiverr different from uh, places like Upwork. Um, so you can see Kaufman, which is the, uh, the co one of the founders of, um, uh, of the platform says, OK, we have turned the labor market into an e-commerce business. And the, the, his image of labor was like something like eBay or Amazon, where, you, uh, where labor is a commodity somehow. Uh, and it's very convenient to buy labor. It's a sort of API if you're a programmer. Um, and then also the narrative of the platform started to change because of course you can imagine that the word seller uh, is not so enticing to, to a media narrative. So they started to speak of uh, micro entrepreneurs and it wasn't so clear in the end who was the actual entrepreneur on the platform, the one buying the service or the one selling the service. And of course like certain people will, would buy services from others in a sort of uh, giant pyramidal scheme. So uh, at a certain point I decided to try the, the platform 
And um, this message stuck with my head. Um, one, one of the key words of the platform is the word doer. And I became a doer, so some, someone who does something in the very moment in which I delegated uh, uh, a, a job, a task. In, in fact, I commissioned a translation of a text that I could, uh, I could have done myself, but I wanted to try. Uh, and in, in fact, it was convenient to, to do that in terms of like balance, uh, uh, let's say trade off cost and benefits. And you can think uh, of the work that happens there uh, as a form of A-B testing. A-B testing is basically trying different features on a website in order to find the most effective ones. And you might find that on Fiverr, um, a lot of people simply um, try different gigs. So they are constantly coming up with new ideas of how they can sell their labor, basically. And this, yeah, and this um, somehow um, expands this notion of creativity as we think it. Normally, we apply this notion of uh, uh, this category of creativity just to creative work. So designers, uh, artists, uh, musicians. Uh, but by looking at platforms like Fiverr, we start to think to realize that creativity is just a generalized category of society at large. Uh, so uh, everyone who doesn't have a stable job has to be creative uh, in, in order to man maintaining a, uh, a life, their livelihood. And uh, I like to quote uh, my friend Sebastian Schmink, who coined this notion of survival creativity. So it's not the creativity uh, that we are like familiar with, but it's an idea of uh, creativity for um, survival and uh, uh, substance, basically, in a, in a regime, in a competitive field, in a regime of scarcity. Uh, and we see how much, um, again, this, this idea of um, a survival creativity uh, and crisis as opportunity is, is, is almost hard-coded in the narrative of the platform. So again, Kaufman, co-founder of the platform, uh, writing on Forbes, uh, wrote um, this, this, which is a typical kind of statement for an entrepreneur. So this, the idea that desperate times force innovative thinking. So this is like how an entrepreneur thinks uh, in terms of uh, crisis. Crisis is, uh, works like an opportunity or like uh, a new set of um, economic coordinates that someone will be able to exploit for their own benefit. Um, of course, you can imagine that uh, um, a place like Fiverr changed uh, a, a lot the cards in the game in the sense that um, um, it, it somehow made really convenient and immediate to outsource, uh, delegate, um, ask other people to do work for you. It's super immediate, you don't need to make calls, uh, the budget is, is low. So in fact, uh, many people I know uh, use it uh, and not just for let's say artistic projects. I really like to translate things, to ask for subtitles, etc. And this is a meme, for example, that was published by the very channel of Fiverr. In fact, you see that uh, the guy here has a, a Fiverr mug or cup in the next to the to the laptop. And also, it shows a bit what's the logic. You don't have an office, you don't have a staff, so you outsource. This is a good way to bootstrap. Uh, a business, big or small. Um, but something that also caught me thinking is the fact that much of the gigs that you see on uh, uh, on Fiverr can can be considered as purely performance per performance art. So, for example, uh, this is a type of gig quite popular by Old Man Steve, in which he would simply um, wish uh, wish you happy birthday by speaking with a banana. He came up with this idea, he got a certain success. So you would get this message on your, <laughs> on your email with uh, this stranger like uh, speaking to you. So there is like this fascination with a stranger, sort of chat roulette style, I would say. Uh, and there are artists who started to use this uh, uh, logic of delegation in their own work. For example, the Italian artist Guido Segni, who commissioned um, uh, works on, uh, workers on Fiverr to write uh, anti-capitalist slogan on their bodies and perform them. 
Uh, so the, the title of the piece is We are the 99% on Fiverr.com. And you can imagine how much like this process of delegation uh, is not simply based on two nodes, but can go um, like on various nodes. No, it can be recursive somehow. And uh, I think like this news somehow represents this idea. So you delegate um, the more to the bottom until uh, there is no, not, not, no one else under you that you can delegate. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, I'm going to just very shortly mention this. So uh, since you can see the recursivity in this image, so at, at a certain point I decided to focus uh, a full exhibition on this. Uh, and so I, I curated the, an exhibition at uh, Onomatope, which is the publishing house who published the book. Uh, in Eindhoven with this idea of like the politics of delegation. Maybe we can go further in the conversation and can mention some of the pieces. Um, uh, Alexia, I hope I have uh, five minutes more just to conclude. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so I would like to conclude by looking back um, um, at this, this dynamic of delegation. How can it be uh, to, to a certain extent reconnected to, to the history of um, uh, art and design. <clears throat> and I'm going to do this by using this notion of dark matter. But let's start from, um, uh, from a painting. So this is uh, a painting by, uh, I hope to pronounce it correctly, by Hungarian Bauhaus professor Laszlo Moholy Nudge. Uh, if the, uh, don't trust me on the pronunciation, check it for yourself. Um, and uh, basically, uh, you see that uh, it's from the, the 20s. Um, and uh, an unofficial title for the series was like Telephone Picture. Um, so the, the, later on, uh, Molinaj said to them, uh, told a story basically about this, uh, this, uh, this painting, this series of paintings. And the story was that uh, uh, he commissioned them and he described them all by the telephone. Um, and uh, it turned out uh, th those those paintings are stored um, um, at the at the MoMA, the Museum of, of Modern Art. Um, and the story goes that um, he might have um, exaggerated this this idea of um, let's say remote uh, remoteness and uh, uh, let's say uh, art supervision, uh, art direction by phone. So the question that comes to mind is why would he do so? Why he could have gone just by himself because the, apparently these were produced in a local factory. So he could have gone and checked the process in person. But of course there was a, a certain ideological reason here. And I, I don't do it more, I don't say it moralistically. I say just uh, there was a certain vision of the future and the present at play there. Um, and uh, of course, you know the Bauhaus. Um, the idea was to um, uh, encourage mass production. And in order to en encourage mass production, you have some, somehow to break the myth of uh, the, the artist alone in the studio, in their studio that um, uh, make, make the piece. Uh, so um, in order to have mass production, you have to somehow uh, break the design phase, the planning phase with the production phase. And this is a bit what uh, Last Romoli uh, Nudge did with this uh, with this series. So there was uh, from now on, you would have an artist uh, that or an artist or a designer that would plan and design, and then uh, um, an invisible mass or an invisible group of uh, craftsmen or workers that would realize uh, this uh, this piece, this work, this service. Um, and clearly this uh, has had big consequences in the history of art and design. You can think of uh, conceptual art um, and instruction art, so Lewitt and so on and so forth. So in a way we can say that uh, um, this, this anecdote highlights three roles. One is the one of the artist, which is like somehow shaking now. Uh, the other one is the art director, the person who plans and suggests and uh, instructs and supervises. And finally, the art worker that in this story uh, is to a certain extent invisible. We don't know, actually, we don't know who did this, uh, who actually produced them. Um, and uh, uh, now making a big jump 
Uh, I'm going to mention this uh, this book by Gregory Cholette, wrote in Dark Matter, uh, wrote in 2011, called Dark Matter. So the idea, uh, uh, the thesis of Gregory Cholette was that much of the art world um, is somehow is sustained by an invisible mass of uh, um, amateur artists, producers, interns, uh, gallerists, uh, like um, uh, art assistants, failed artists, uh, of course, in quotes. Without this mass, um, the elite uh, artists that we know uh, and the whole the system would somehow collapse. So this is the thesis, and you can see how this relates to uh, an invisible uh, army of, of art workers. Uh, but I think with the, uh, with Fiverr and uh, that kind of, uh, let's say, online power at the delegation, we have um, a certain um, uh, a new model emerges. So uh, one thing that um, it's important to say is that the artwork itself within the cultural structure in which is shown uh, is a machine for distinction. It, dist it creates distinction between these three roles. It's basically the prism through which you think of the artist as the artist or like the executor as the executor. Um, so the shift I was telling you about, uh, I would call it a bit like this. So in the case of uh, Molly Nudge, we could speak of a certain labor invisibility because if it's not the artist who actually materializes the artwork, it's someone else that we don't know and we don't see. But with, with these new forms of online power delegation, we have a form of uh, hyper visibility in the sense that we see the workers, they are present and they even become sometimes the content of, uh, of like the work we do. Uh, this is an example, for example, is a portfolio website that uses uh, one of this, uh, uh, this uh, Fiverr workers to present uh, the work of the this uh, European uh, designer, if I remember well. So the point is, of course, that here what is capitalized upon, and again, I don't say it in a moralistic sense because the uh, the transaction is legitimate, but of course, what makes the, the idea uh, smart and interesting uh, to a European audience is somehow to use, um, uh, like to have this shift that someone uh, with with, uh, with with someone something that you might call as a European an exotic background an exotic setting or a, even a domestic uh, setting might talk about the um, uh, the work of a European of uh, or uh, American or uh, yeah of, or uh, uh, designer from the United States. So um, when I speak of hyper visibility, I mean um, I mean. The fact that, OK, we see the work, but this this kind of work uh, and this kind of uh, modality of uh, delegation doesn't actually reveal uh, the, the, the labor relationship. So we see the body, the face, the voice, we hear the voice of the worker, but still like the working relationship uh, is made obscure. So it's not less obscure than the, uh, the more large art workers. <clears throat> and to really conclude, um, I want to mention a few initiatives that, in my opinion, go towards, uh, um, instead of like distincting this role, they, they go towards in distinction. Uh, and some of them, and I invite you to check them, uh, them up online, are Art Workers Italia, Cultural Workers Unite in Rotterdam, and the Tech Workers Coalition. The, the three of them uh, have how to put it? Uh, they, um, they they don't they, they they broaden the field. Let's say they say okay. Um, they don't they, they are not like an association for artists, for example, but for art workers. Who are art workers? Artists, but also graphic designers, but also uh, artist assistants. So you see that <coughs> the typical hierarchy in place uh, is somehow broken in this uh, unionization system. Same goes with cultural workers <coughs> and same goes with tech workers coalition in which even the workers in the cafeteria of a big uh, big tech company are considered tech workers uh, from the, to the coalition. 
<coughs> and I'm going to really stop because I have to drink some water. So thanks so much. <coughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Silvio. Um, so now we would switch to the, the, um, the discussion part of, of tonight. Um, and I have to say, you know, something I felt from the discussion with Master Media Design students last week is really the need for exit strategies. You know, it's really the need of uh, trying to find guidelines, uh, you know, like concrete solution as much as we can. Uh, so maybe we can try to, you know, to answer the question that they had. And the first thing, you know, that I, I will ask a more general question and then we will go more into detail around Fiverr and also around uh, the idea of us be becoming uh, um, projects, you know. So the first question I think that really the, the students felt strongly about was the, this idea of uh, cognitive dissonance. You know, we, they said, OK, great, like we all want to, we all feel the urgency of changing the system we are working in, you know, we, we all want to um, to, to kill capitalism, you know, I'm quoting one of my students right now, but um, how actually can you do this when you have to pay uh, your rent, when you have to make a living, you know, how can we live with these paradoxes inside ourselves as designers when you have to survive creatively, especially when you see platforms such as Fiverr's, we're just, it's really hard to value your work ne next to, you know, platforms such as um, uh, Fiverr or all the other ones that are existing right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, the cognitive dissonance. Um, I mean, uh, for me, like one important thing to say is that uh, uh, no, no single narrative uh, is m more real than the other, in the sense that uh, when we look at the mirror and we consider ourselves project, is as real and as when we uh, see ourselves uh, as uh, let's say subjugated subject to use the uh, the, the the notion that uh, uh, that Byung Chung Han has. But one point is this, and I think it's important in order to create coalitions and advance demands. The fact that in order to maintain the status of project, in order to actually be able to reinvent oneself and to uh, let's say invest in oneself, one has to have some degrees of uh, security and uh, uh, some degrees of protection. Uh, and he, I think, uh, I mean, you mentioned capitalism. <coughs> of course, uh, it, it's, it's a big word, it's a, it's a, it's a big concept, so I, I don't want to go there. But uh, clearly, uh, I think we, we can all agree that, um, let's say, uh, innovation doesn't really thrive uh, in periods of, uh, uh, of scarcity. Uh, it's not that, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the statement that of uh, Misha Kaufman, they say it's like, okay, desperate times call for uh, innovative thinking. Uh, I think at least we might question that. And we might think of many periods in, uh, uh, in, in our recent history in which like things were sort of stabilized and still like the, the line of progress, um, um, let's say uh, the line of progress or at least of innovation uh, has uh, arised. So uh, yeah, I think it's a matter of scale. We have, of, of course, uh, certain change is valuable and welcome, <coughs> but it's not that we, we have to look at any possible change, even at the fundamental change of like uh, having or not having a house and calling it an opportunity. So uh, a call for like a basic stability is what really would guarantee more um, proper solid innovation and not like this creative destruction, which is uh, I remember Bernard Ziegler calling it instead like destructive destruction. And you know, at the same time, um, just as a, as a follow up on that, uh, especially in media design, something that students feel is how can we cope with the constant pressure of having to update our skills all the time? You know, do we ever acquire enough you know, skills? And and when does this life in beta stop? Does it ever stop? Okay, um, this is a very valid question. I, I mean, I'm uh, in education, so I ask myself this question on a daily basis. What is, um, 
let's say what what are skills also that escape a bit the permanent beta uh, mentality um, i mean uh, maybe this is a bit unpopular to say but i believe that uh, uh, academies and university have their own share of responsibility in the sense that uh, very often they are also like um, going uh, going very uh, like fast when a new fad or a new trend is emerging because uh, it's presented as the new. And I want to make a little example that uh, to, to, uh, sticks. Uh, I mean, for me, it's very important to speak of uh, uh, of like what it means to have skills that uh, can last and uh, uh, allow still to build upon which doesn't mean that you learn it and you learn it for good and you don't learn anything else. <coughs> but if you think of uh, HTML, HTML, CSS, I mean, I know it's, uh, it's a basic uh, knowledge, but still has been resilient. What, you, uh, what I learned like uh, 20 years ago as uh, uh, HTML, is, well, 20 years ago, well, a bit less, <laughs> well, let's say eight years ago, um, 10 years ago, uh, is still valid today. So uh, a way to, um, let's say, to ask for uh, competences and skills that uh, escape for the permanent data is possible uh, and has to do also with, uh, let's say, um, a critical look at technology because uh, nowadays um, the, the skills uh, that we are asked to acquire within um, uh, higher education, especially in design, are very, uh, very often uh, conjoined with, with technology. Uh, and th the way this happens is very often by means of uh, asking, uh, of turning um, a knowledge that is autonomous and convivial, so something that you can tweak to your own uh, means, to a, to, a tool, um, uh, to a tool kind of uh, model in which uh, you learn a software that uh, uh, the, the, the week after might be uh, let's say updated and, and therefore you are made obsolete. So uh, there are technologies that are industrial in which uh, you become the tool to a certain extent. And uh, yeah, I think all the video conferencing one to a certain extent uh, uh, fall in this category. And there are other technologies that might be more humble uh, but are more convivial, convivial in the sense, in the illich sense or, or like the, uh, that give a certain degree of autonomy to the person who learns them. And, you know, as a, you know, it's another pressure that, that we feel <coughs> the creative industry, so there's this pressure of updating our skills constantly, but also there's a pressure of uh, building your personal narrative and also um, it's kind of just become the norm, you know, the sharing your personal narrative, always sharing your work, sharing your process. I mean, even in your work, in your book, you mentioned that uh, niceness and enthusiasm are the linga franca of art and design. And I'm just, I'm just interested to know, uh, you know, what do you think are the, are the effects of having to appear always working on designers' practices today? And could we ever even exist next to this platform uh, and still feel like we matter as as practitioners. Uh, that's that's a big a big issue. I mean, um, it's I know it's a banality, but one has to ask themselves uh, mm -hmm. to what extent uh, uh, they can emerge um, as practitioners without uh, having uh, given in into social media practice, especially with visual uh, with visual practices. Uh, I mean, how, to what extent is a uh, visual practice possible if not uh, uh, built, um, let's say, in, in parallel with, uh, with an Instagram persona? Of course, there are exceptions, but uh, I, I'm not sure uh, like how, how big this, uh, how, um, let's say, how, how relevant these exceptions are. Mm. Um, so I, I think, let's say, there are two issues here. So one has to do with um, uh, the, the public presentation of one's work. Uh, and another one has to do with, uh, with the attitude, let's say, with which this work is presented. And, uh, um, and again, let's tackle, let's say, this second aspect, uh, the aspect of niceness, of uh, 
let's say, having a certain characterial or developing a certain characterial disposition. Um, so again, I think this is strongly connected to the notion of skills. Because, um, I mean, if we broaden the, 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 our understanding of um, uh, a skill-based economy, if, we don't just, uh, if you don't just look at design, uh, and uh, we look in general at the third sector, the tertiary sector, uh, I think we might agree uh, to say that uh, uh, there is a general de-skilling in the sense that um, um, like hard skills uh, are less uh, necessary in most, uh, let's say, supervision job, managerial job, office jobs. Uh, the, the actual hard skills are very often, like shared by many, um, being, used, being able to send emails and to reply to them, uh, Excel sheets, Google Drive, etc. Um, so if this is the case, what comes to the fore uh, are the soft skills, the, the interpersonal skills, uh, and they play a bigger and bigger, uh, bigger and bigger role. Uh, and this, I believe, is true also for design. So um, I, I personally think that uh, I mean I wrote in another text specifically about design that um, uh, it's time somehow to define a certain emotional counterculture. Uh, and by that I meant a culture in which a certain degree of negativity or introversion uh, is as valid as like, let's say, the person who is able to, to, do, to give a TED talk. In order to make this possible, um, a certain revendication of uh, hard skill, of the, the peculiarity of, uh, of design practice, uh, I think should be at the center. Um, so I, I, I think the movement in the last, uh, I would say, let's say from the 60s on of design culture has been uh, towards an expansion, uh, an expansion of uh, fields, techniques, approaches, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, again, borrowing from programming, um, it didn't leave any of the variable uh, of a design practice stable. So, um, in many cases, nothing has, like, has, uh, is a constant. So, it's very hard to, uh, to call it a field, even. So, I think uh, a good step into direction also, re um, let's say, revalue uh, the quality of designers in society is to call for um, a certain degree of specificity. And uh, this should be done at a certain, uh, at a certain local level. So each institution, each organization, uh, each, uh, let's say, scene should be able to redefine their own specificity and to clarify them very clearly. Uh, and this is an attempt that is very hard to do because, again, there is um, institutional pressure to, to renovate yourself, not only as a person, but also as an institution. And I think institutions should have, should have the the strength and, the, yeah, let's say, the energy to, to refuse this um, exogenous pressure to change themselves because their knowledge they in a way a lot of knowledge has been lost to um to to, to this uh, renovation let's say uh, ideology thank you there is actually already five minutes left to our talk and i like to share um, a question from the um, okay from the chat there there are two let's see if we can um uh, let's see if we can. There's actually the first one. Uh, is so. What can designers do to go against the entrepreneuria? And I think you know you touched a little bit on that with your last slide about the various union. And the second question: um, Do you see an opportunity in the increased use of open source software? Which is funny because this is what we talked about prior to the talk when we were waiting to be live. Um, yeah. So, I don't know which one you want to start with, uh, maybe, you know, the second question is also an answer to the first one. Uh, okay. but yeah. and, and then we will, we will end uh, the talk. Let's, let's, uh, I mean, let's mention the open source uh, software here. Also to uh, bring to the fore, like, 
what happens on the back. I mean, both uh, Loren and me are generally uh, are open source free software users. Uh, and this is the reason why uh, part of this, uh, this unfortunate technical, um, the, the, yeah, this technical problem sort of uh, took place. Um, I mean, I have, the connection between uh, uh, free software flaws and uh, the entire precariat, I don't know how really to connect it, but I want to say something. Um, and uh, like my reason to use uh, free software is a bit uh, this uh, this ability to have like not to, to have like these industrial tools that turn you into uh, into a tool for themselves. But there is a very like more basic reason that is that. Uh, um, free free software makes my life slightly more interesting, slightly more rich. Mm -hmm. So I learn new things uh, because like there is no default way to do a certain thing. So every time, every day, if you have the time available, you can rediscover your workflow. So that's my uh, big big fascination and, and um, yeah admiration for for free software. However. Uh, with with the coronavirus and the kind of online uh, exodus, I see that, that uh, the lock-in is becoming way more uh, way strong. It's hard. It's becoming hard to gain a practice. Having a Mac now for this talk. Um, yeah, it will be harder and harder. So this is the time in which, I mean, if you are in an institution and if you have the power to do so, you have to sort of raise your hand and say, okay, look, I have the right to choose again to my own, my own workflows, my own systems. It's again a battle of autonomy. And I think that autonomy is really the, let's say, one of the biggest value that within design, uh, design community we can Fight well, fight for is a big word, but yeah, defend, defend. Let's say. Well, there are still so many questions I like to ask, but you know, I feel this was so short. But thank you so much, Silvio, um, for you know being here tonight for your virtual presence with us. Um, and uh, you know, maybe as you said, you have an asynchronous discussion with Lorraine. I will ask her also some question, and we will do a recorded presentation with Lorraine. And we will try to also bounce back on the talk we had tonight. Um, so thank you very much and uh, see you soon, I hope. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Have a nice thank evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Silvio. Thank you so much.